I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute for Computational Science here at Dartmouth College. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Fall Donahoe Colloquium, Using AI to Keep History Alive, from Heather Mayo, the managing director of Conscience Display. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64 and former trustee of the college. Uh, information transmission is one of the main tasks and has inspired many of the innovations of computational science. At its heart, it's the manipulation of an alphabet, organized in some agreed upon form, packaged up with meaning and intention by a source and sent to a recipient to be disentangled and hopefully received with its meaning intact, literally in a science, in a neuroscientific sense, enabling one person to make an impression on another. In this way, writing may be considered to be among the earliest of computational technologies. It enables us to send information across time and space, to pass it on to future generations, preserving stories so that the past is not forgotten. In this sense, computation is an important piece of historical and cultural preservation, providing an evolving set of means and media for keeping memories alive. These days, that preservation extends from words to images, sounds, and even objects, and computation plays a large role in each of these contexts. That said, there is, however, something lost in having only artifacts, digital or otherwise, as the primary objects for interrogating the past. As for written words, Socrates famously said, you'd think they were speaking as if they had some understanding, but if you question anything that has been said because you want to learn more, it continues to signify just the very same thing forever. I can't help but point out the irony of only being able to tell you this because his words were written down. <clears throat> that said, there is something to what Socrates um, writes. The words do lie, whether it be on the cave wall, tablet, page, or screen, and we must work to bring them to life. Socrates' objections derive from a worry that the rise of writing would come at the expense of the oral tradition and memorization, and a worry that with that something would be lost. He quotes the Egyptian king Thamus as saying, you've not discovered a potion for remembering, but for reminding with words. Um, he was not wrong. There is something to being able to have an actual conversation as a means of investigating the past. If you're lucky enough, you can speak to one who is actually present at the moment of the event of interest. And if you're even luckier, he or she will actually remember what happened and allow you to explore their experience with them. There's even neuroscientific data that suggests that dialogue provides a means of internalizing information in a different way from reading or viewing. Conversation and interview is in essence one of the earliest forms of active learning. But of course, sometimes the witnesses are no longer present then what do we do? Well, I think Socrates would have been very intrigued by the creative approach to the challenge of the preservation of historical testimony taken by the company Conscious Display. Conscious Display is a graphic design company specializing in exhibition design and interactive storytelling. By integrating holographic rendering and natural language processing, they are pioneering a new form of cultural and testimonial preservation creating an environment that allows a curious person to have something of the storytelling experience um, with original witnesses of history, even after they are no longer with us, and to experience something of the power of conversation and exchange that is for many a crucial part of the imprinting of the memory of one person on another. Today's Donahoe Colloquium speaker, Heather Mayo, is the managing director of Conscience Display. Conscience Display has produced temporary traveling and permanent exhibitions for the USC Shoah Foundation, Aegis Trust, the United Nations, the Museum of Tolerance, and the UK National Holocaust Center. Heather is an experiential exhibit designer who has exhibited in Los Angeles, Cuba, and the United Nations. 
Heather holds a BA in Jewish Studies from San Diego State University and is concept developer of a new entity, New Dimensions in Testimony, the conversational interviews developed there for the public to experience interactive stories. Heather's work has been featured on NBC's Today Show the, and in the, in the New Yorker and on the BBC. Heather's also on the board of the USC Shoah Foundation and now serves as CEO of StoryFile, an interactive storytelling app that uses powerful natural language processing and artificial intelligence to make video interaction just like a real conversation. By using uh, user interfaces to document our lives in real time, Stories can be preserved and interacted with for generations to come. She's a pioneer in the exciting new world of digitally enabled museum exhibition. We are delighted that she could make time to share her important work with us today. Please join me in welcoming Heather Mayo. Thank you. That was so sweet. <laughs> that was so sweet. Thank you. I am going to correct you in one note, though. Um, I am not on the board of the show at the USC Shoah Foundation. <laughs> I have to change my bio. Um, however, my husband does is the executive director for. Okay, <laughs> um, that might have been where it came from. Um, maybe I will be on the board one day. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to Dan Rothmore for inviting me and being so generous and hospitable this week. And thank you to Christine. I put her through hell <laughs> the past eight months. I apologize, but I really appreciate the invitation and the time to talk to you. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of history. He did a great job. I think I could probably leave it at that and we could go on to re the reception. But um, I'm an exhibitional, uh, an experiential exhibition designer. Yes, okay. Uh, I happen to study and be a student of, or a historian of uh, Holocaust studies as well. My main focus was on intergenerational Holocaust testimony and how different generations or subsequent generations remember or interpret or internalize that story or that experience. Um, many of them will say that they've kind of experienced the Holocaust in a uh, subconscious or what do you call it when you absorb something? What's that word? Embedded. Embedded. <laughs> Internalized that, that experience of their parents and grandparents. Um, anyway, that aside, that's a whole other lecture. Um, I was working on one such exhibition for the UK Holocaust Center. And uh, it, I should say in all fairness, uh, with Stephen Smith at the time. And we were having conversations and Q and A's beyond the filming interview that we were doing with these Holocaust survivors and their families. And Stephen Smith, it, his doctorate was in um, the trajectory of memory and how that changes over time. So he's been involved in um, talking to and interviewing and dealing with Holocaust survivors since he was 20. Um, it, we started talking about how sad and how problematic it was going to be um, for future generations, for my grandchildren, who would never have the opportunity to hear a Holocaust survivor in person, yet let alone ask them any questions of their own. And in going back to that user-led education, um, something happens when you all are going to get a chance to ask me questions in about 45 minutes or 40 minutes if I stick to my time. Um, that engagement that we'll have will be very different for you than the engagement you're feeling right now. And we knew this. So it was very problematic since all of us in my generation understood what happened in World War II through, because of, or through, from the perspective of these survivors. And we didn't want to lose that for future generations because we have valued it. And obviously the, the world has valued it. If they hadn't, they wouldn't continually ask them to come back and talk about it year after year 
day after day in hundreds and hundreds and thousands of locations all over the world. So there, there was, we were getting some value from it. So we wanted to somehow not replace it, but try and find a way to replicate that experience. What was it? What was it? How could we replicate the experience of you listening to a Holocaust survivor tell their story and then you being able to ask the questions on your mind and get those answers directly from them? Not the second generation, not the third generation, not reading it in a book, but get your answer as if they were talking to you. I was asked early on in this project, um, why can't we use the the Holocaust, the 55,000 um, survivor testimonies that the Shoah Foundation had taken already? And the, the issue is that, that is, that's an amazing archive and it will stand the test of time and it'll be there for researchers and, and the public forever. And it's a truly, truly unique and valuable archive, but it's in a narrative form. So we couldn't just pull the, this archive, which I'll explain to you later in the, the talk, is uh, broken out into one minute segments. So all 104 hours of it are broken out into individual one minute segments. But you enter one of those segments and the person could be talking about anything in any way. So you actually enter the narrative at that point. So it's not as if I'm wording the response as if I would if I was answering your question, which is why we had to refilm them. So. Um, what it actually happened is after Stephen and I were done working on that exhibition called Generations, um, I came to the show foundation with an idea that we had talked to uh, over the time, over time, um, I had done some sort of experimenting on it and think, said, I was learning about the show foundation as well. This is another long story, but Stephen Smith ended up actually the um, executive director of the Shoah Foundation during this time period as well. So I was learning a, a little bit about the Shoah Foundation and their search capability, and I thought, this is amazing. We should be able to use your search ability to interact some way with the survivors. And we kept looking at it and peeling the layers and peeling the layers. What would that mean? What would we have to do? And da da da. Then, um, well, first, I want to I want to show you. I'm going to work backwards, and I'm showing going to show you actually the end result. Hello, hello, hello. How are you? Not too bad. Are you a Holocaust survivor? Yes, I did. I survived the Holocaust. Would you mind if I ask you a couple questions? You can ask me any questions you like. Do you believe in God? You know, it's very difficult to answer this question about believe in God. I think that the essence, your essence, as being were brought up in my environment was an inherent belief in the Almighty. How, what, and when, you didn't question. And I still don't question. So as far as I'm concerned, I have a very deep belief in the Almighty. I don't uh, speculate on what he is, how he is, what he looks like, whether he looks like at all. As far as I'm concerned, I always remember uh, the first uh, words of Genesis, Bereshis Buralahim, God, you know, created the word and his spirit was floating on the waters. Now, what that means, I don't know. How can you believe in God after everything that you've gone through? How can you possibly not believe in God? I mean, to survive such an ap apocalyptic inferno as the Holocaust, I mean, there's only one way. You know, you either believe in, in chance or you believe 
in providence. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I believe in providence. Do you have a question for him? What was your experience in the camp? Okay, so you're not mic'd. <laughs> what was your experience in the concentration camps like? Life in the camp was indescribable because it was living death. And that's the only way I can describe it. Being in a concentration camp or even on a working camp during the Holocaust was living like living death. You were just one centimeter from the grave. Okay. Yes. Okay. So this was part of the Generations exhibit that Steve and I were doing for the UK Holocaust Center, the National UK Holocaust Center. And um, it, it, we were just so struck because these people, I met with, I had the pleasure of meeting with your ex-president this morning, uh, Wright? Yeah, Jim Wright. Jim Wright. And we were talking about Vietnam veterans and their experience. But um, these people are, they're truly amazing. Really, really amazing. Um, they all have PTSD. Um, they've all dealt with it in different ways. Um, but for the majority, in mass, they've gone on and they've had productive, happy, normal lives. And the resilience in them, it is something truly amazing. And I would, ha I would have hated for all of your children, your grandchildren, to lose the experience of learning from them for future generations, which is why we developed the, the program. Um, you know, there's testimony. There are museums, um, plenty of Holocaust museums around the world. Um, there's the, you know, never again, there's the, the core oral history about remembering it and not forgetting, but I think I always took it, their lives and their experience a little bit wider and more, um, universal than just concentrating on what they went through in the Holocaust. It, it was such an intense period of time and they saw truly the, the most evil part of humanity, and they survived and they lived through it. And what is that like? And how does that, how can I learn from that? Even if I have a normal life, even if I have no reference whatsoever, thank God, uh, for war or, or that kind of um, unbelievable tragedy they went through. Um, what can I learn from them? So we, we wanted to somehow, yes, you've got these people's lives and you've got the artifacts and you've got the books and you've got the movies. We just wanted to give you another option, another layer to it, to learn about who they were and how they've lived. Um, part of this is the, uh, what was my, my quote this morning? Ne uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Right? Is that how the quote goes? Um, to raise new questions and new possibilities and to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks the advance in, real advance in science. Um, when we started this project, it was 2009, and all these survivors, a lot of the survivors were dying, unfortunately. We, we became, the entire field of Holocaust studies became obsessed and, and worried about what was gonna to happen to Holocaust education once they were no longer here. So we were truly faced with necessity and we were desperate. We needed to find a way to, to, have, to replicate this one aspect um, for future generations. So it was election night and this added to my whole, my whole thought process. Um, 
We're joined now uh, via hologram uh, with by uh, Will I Am, uh, who is live in Grand Park. Let's see if we can uh, beam him in now. There we go. Will, thanks very much for being with us. Uh, how is this night for you? Oh, this is great. You know, we're at the eve of uh, a brand new day in America, and it feels good being here in Chicago. Uh, all this technology I'm being beamed to you, like it's Star Wars and stuff. Yeah, it it's, looks it's like great. basically like exactly like in uh, in Star Trek when they would beam people down. That's what it looks like right here. Okay, so we were all, I'm sure, glued to the to the sets that evening, and we were on a hopefully a new new generation, <laughs> new life, <laughs> new era. Um, I saw this in 2000, in the fall of 2008, and this was when Cisco in, introduced a technology called telepresence. The issue was with this is you needed a live person. So my question was, what if you don't have a live person, but you're essentially you know, filming this person with a camera in Chicago and then putting his visual representation into another space? So why can't you do that with a filmed version of an individual. Seems simple, right? <laughs> um, it took us six years to, it, well, it took, a, so I went to the show of Foundation. It ha this whole project had to be lie with the show of Foundation. It had to be theirs. They are the, lar the world's largest audiovisual archive um, of Holocaust survivor testimony in the world. They are the resource to every single Holocaust class, Holocaust museum, anything researchers, anything, any class from fourth grade through university, any research that's done is done with the Shoah Foundation around the world. This project, if it was gonna have a life in its own, on its own, I could have done this for any museum, that's fine, but it wouldn't have had a life, it wouldn't have, been in every museum. It wouldn't have been available to every museum. The, Hol the U UC Shoah Foundation is a resource. So all their content is basically open to all of you. And that's what we wanted for this particular archive. Um, let's see. There we go. This is a friend of mine. Her name is Rose Schindler. Um, so I was, my, my film crew in San Diego, where I was working for, out of, at the time, was just getting into filming in 3D for, for the glasses and everything. And they said, oh, no, 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 we have to film a Holocaust survivor in 3D. It'll be so cool. And da, da, da. So I said, all right, well, I'm actually, I've got this idea, you know, about this conversation. So let's film it in 3D and let's see if it makes a difference to how immersive the environment is. Let's see if it makes a difference in whether or not you feel as if you're really having a conversation. Um, the, the vision for this project was I wanted to be able to sit, uh, sit a Holocaust down like Dan is now, and I wanted to be able to sit next to that Holocaust survivor or at the end of the table across from the Holocaust survivor and actually feel as if they were in the space and I was having a conversation with them. That was the entire vision. And so I said, okay, maybe 3D can work. And they, they were all, oh, this is going to be the wave of the future. Everybody's going to have their own glasses. This is going to be great. Um, we filmed Rose in uh, 3D, and she answered about 12 questions. And all we did really is we put the question options like on the other side of the screen, you know, and you could tap on it and she would respond. So museums have been doing that for probably 20, 25 years. And it worked okay. Um, in the 3D glasses, it was okay but I didn't like it because you were changing your physical being. I wanted you to just walk in there as you were, sit down and be able to see it. So I said, okay, if, if Cisco can do this with telepresence, maybe I can get Cisco to do this with video, recorded video. Um, they weren't interested, <laughs> but then I said to myself, all right, there's gotta be someone working on true hologram technology. We didn't care where in the world. Um, oh, I should back up. So I did go to the Shoah Foundation, and they told me, great idea. Why don't you go and see if you can make it work? 
<laughs> if you can find the technologies, it will make it all work. Um, they weren't, it, there was no money to do any of this at the time. Um, we had no idea how much it would cost anyway. Um, and we didn't know if it could actually, if it would work, if it would do what we wanted it to do, if it would be similar, if the, how the audience would respond to a, a videoed person, none of it. So they were really taking a leap of faith even with letting me play around with it and try and do it. So I went out and um, I found another institute and, okay, that, that was the... USC Shoah Foundation. Um, oh, this is the USC Shoah Foundation um, archive. I don't know if any of you have seen this. It, it's, an, it's truly amazing. You know, how many of you go on Netflix or YouTube? Okay, so that search engine was actually created by the Shoah Foundation's CTO, whose father... Sam Gussman's father is not here. He is here. Maybe not. No. Okay. So Sam Gussman's father was this Alan. His first name. And he teaches here, right? Yeah. Um. Anyway, so when you use uh, Netflix or uh, YouTube, you're actually using their their search technology. Nothing had existed to search video in the early '90s yet with the with regard to the internet. So they went through all 104,000 hours, broke everything down into these index terms that you see here. There are 50, over 55,000 index terms that they've, that they've identified. Um, someone would listen. It's, it's basically crowdsourced. Someone would listen in, to the entire interview. And every minute of that interview, they would put in keywords. They wouldn't transcribe it but they would put in keywords about what that person was talking about at the time. So you can search it by anything and it'll bring you right, right into that minute and you can view it. Um, it. You can view by language, you can view by experience, male, female, they, so many different ways to narrow it down to get at the content because otherwise there would be no way anyone could sit there and listen to the entire thing. I mean. How old are you? You. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Okay. So if you had started as an intern 25 years ago, you would be 74 years old by the time you went back to your boss and said, what else would you like me to do? If you, if you had watched the whole archive. So you'd be right in the middle of your career right now. <laughs> um, it's a it's a lot of content, so they couldn't use it for education educational purposes without creating something like that. Um, unfortunately, they never took advantage of the thirteen patents, but that's my my issue. <laughs> um, this is Stephen Smith, and so um, he. He really was he got the idea and got it big time, um, not only because I was dating him, but at the time. <laughs> um, we were both in this world, and we were both very concerned about a Holocaust survivor, and um, obviously because of his PhD and his whole life, um, interested in continuing to tell that story any way possible. Uh, when he did come to the show of Foundation, um, even though he he believed in the project, obviously, and was a real advocate for it. Um, it was very, very difficult to, con to convey what we were thinking to other people. Like, you just interacted with Pincus here, and it seems, I'm sure, to you very normal now. No? Somewhat normal? Imaginable. Yeah, yeah. Like, like he was on Skype, right? <laughs> and you're, you're now used to using Siri. It works really well now. You know, five years ago, you were ready to throw your mobile phone at the wall. Um, but it's getting more and more ubiquitous. So, but at the time, this was kind of before Skype. And we, what we thought was obvious, we were having a hard time selling to people. Um, we knew it was going to be very expensive to do, to figure out, and um, ICT 
I found, um, I went off on a tangent, didn't I? Yeah, sorry, I'll go back to the holographic in, um, holographic um, imagery. This is actually one of the first true holograms created. It was of his head. You could see around 30, 360 degrees. The problem was it was actually created by spinning mirrors. Now, can you imagine me putting a, an exhibition with spinning mirrors going uh, what, 100 miles an hour in a museum with kids coming in? Yeah, never going to work. <laughs> so so um, even though we found them, I at the same lecture, TEDx lecture that you saw the previous slide, I found um, Andrew Jones uh, from ICT, uh, Institute for Creative Technologies, which I had found. I knew they were going to be there. I found them. Then I found out they were actually a USC institute, which really helped because Shoah Foundation was the USC institute. And I said, great, this is all in the family. They could cooperate. They could work together. Yeah, that was, that was a, long, a long haul to get both of them, both institutes to work together. Um, another lesson in, in interdisciplinary work within, in college, within universities. Um, so I said to him, and he's about six foot two, and I went up to him and I said, I want you to capture a Holocaust survivor, and I want, to, I want you to project him sitting in a room so that I can talk to him. And he literally looked over me, <laughs> like just over my head, and you could see like a, a typical engineer, science, scientist, and you could see his head, his mind going. It, it just ran with it. It was amazing. And I, I had to get Andrew, <laughs> I'm down here. But um, he knew exactly, I, I think he, he saw where I wanted to go. And it was really inspiring because it was the first person that actually kind of got it, which was amazing. Um, we thought, we thought the industry would understand. I mean, the the graphic, the Hollywood industry, since they were so into these fantastical graphics and this and making this happen and this happen, we thought they would get it. Nobody got it. It was really a really really hard sell, surprisingly. Um, then I learned, started to learn more about ICT Institute for Creative Technologies, and. It, Previously, I had thought that we would use uh, the Shoah Foundation search technology, but they, ICT also had what they called the Natural Language Lab in 2009, and they were working on a project for ah, the Boston Science Museum. So some of you must have, might have seen it, the twins. The, the twins at this museum, um, the it, they were set up as docents to the museum. So you come into the museum and you ask the, the twins where to go. Where can I find this? Where can I, what should I do? Um, it worked pretty well. ICT in general, the Institute for Creative Technologies, um, was born out of, um, it's a research lab, and it's primarily for the Army and for Army and um, the armed, armed Services training. So they've done a lot with virtual characters. Um, as you can see, the, the twins are virtual characters. They're um, graphically, char they're caricatures of individuals. This is not as far as they took it. They also were the um, creators of the movie Avatar. Did anyone see that? So they were the, the um, facial, rec they were responsible, and Andrew was actually the person responsible for the scanning and the facial recognition that made that movie and that technology all possible. So... I said, okay, if they can do that with virtual characters, why can't we do that with real people? Okay, so that took two years to talk through. Um, then we fast forward to our first, we said, okay, nobody's getting it. We have to do a demo, just a proof of concept, just to see what people's reactions really are about it, see if we're on the right track. So we did this proof of concept in 2012. This was the light stage that was built. Um, it was built previously, it existed already. It was mainly for um, 
special effects in movie, um, they would, for example, put someone on a treadmill and he would walk and then they would put him into a piazza in Rome or in a movie or something like that. Um, so mainly built for special effects. Um, it had about 6,000 LED lights. We can relight the subject if we wanted to. We could put him, let's say he's in this room because shadows are very important. So you know that I'm here because you see the shadows on, on me. Um, if I was lit up with fluorescent lighting right now, you would think it was really weird. And you'd say, no, she's actually not there with you. So we needed to be able to relight the subject. Um, we filmed them all against a green screen. Eventually the green screen got bigger. Um, we first had to determine whether or not a Holocaust survivor, so no one had been in this contraption for more than 20 minutes at a time. We were asking an 85 year old person, average age, to go into this, uh, most of them called it the cage. Um, they all had different words for it. Um, to go in this for five hours five for five days. And um, so it was a, and it was bright. As you can see, he's wearing sunglasses right now because we were recalibrating. Um, so it was a pretty big physical ask and we didn't know if they could actually do it. So we brought in another survivor in LA. And we put them in there to sit and they, pretty much said, yeah, it's okay. I think they, we can handle it. So we tried it with Pankas for two days. Um, it went really well. The, the proof of concept worked. We, we only had 18 responses in that. His subsequent interview that we did has 1,936 responses. So in that type of a, with that type of data set, you can really have a conversation. For example, you could probably talk to Pincus for about 18 hours if you wanted to, straight, and never hear the same answer. Um, this was another survivor that we did. We ultimately decided to green screen the entire space. Um, we started filming them volumetrically as well. So we started doing the actual scan while we were doing the whole interview. Instead of scanning them at the end of the interview, um, there's a whole various reasons. We ended up doing, um, the intention was to do 10 survivors to get sort of a, not a 360 because we weren't doing any perpetrators, but to get a 180 of the Holocaust experience, or what people experienced in the Holocaust. So we looked for different experiences. We looked for gender balance. We looked for um, somewhat different ages. You know, all these people were going to be relatively around the same age when they survived. Um, we were looking for different, if you were born in a different country, so they all had, someone had to have different trajectories through the Holocaust to be a part of the archive. They all had to have spoken in the public a great deal. Um, we needed them to be, when they were asked a question, like Pinkus was asked about God, we needed them to be somewhat familiar with answering questions like that. Um, it would just, it made it easier for them to understand the, the format. Um, it was interesting, there wasn't, we kept telling this, they, they wanted to do it, they got it, and they all really wanted to do it, and we kept telling them, you know, it's not going to be easy, you know, we were very discouraging trying to manage them, and they were like, no, 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 I've been doing this for 20 years, I'm a pro, I've answered every question under the sun, there's nothing you can't ask me, <laughs> and sure enough, by the third day, they were, they were, saying I was sadistic and I was torturing them. Um, they all finished, you know, and they were all incredibly grateful at the end of it, but it was a big ask to do this with them. Um, so there's Steven, he's interviewing. We did, um, we ventured out into multiple languages. Ultimately, we've done 18 survivors, and we did one survivor of the Nanjing massacre um, uh, yeah, one survivor, one survivor of the Nanjing massacre in Mandarin. So we did uh, a little bit of Polish, a little bit of Hebrew. He, we interviewed him in Hebrew for two days, um, and mostly English, and then one um, person in Mandarin. This was during the break. This is hysterical. This, this so this woman, 
who you see the no smoking sign with the, the fan. <laughs> so she she has smoked like at least a pack a day ever since she got out was liberated. Like literally since the day she was liberated. She's 92 years old and she came from England to do this interview with us. She was amazing, amazing. Um, she kept saying that uh, every one of them had like a quote that they were that they were pretty famous for. She she used to love to say how complete idiots the Germans were. <laughs> Just you know the the for instance she says that um, the fact that they followed their own laws to the extent that they had to arrest her and her sister and keep her in jail until they were tried when they knew that they were ultimately only going to send them to Auschwitz actually saved her. She said, a complete idiot. So you always did all this money and time and they kept her alive in jail for maybe eight months waiting for trial at only to be convicted, obviously, and sent to Auschwitz. She happened to be the cellist. She survived because she was the cellist in the... Um, Orchestra in Auschwitz. Uh, this is Madame Shaw in Mandarin, Hebrew. Um, she's a she's a crack. She's she's an amazing. And this one's in the. Um, if any of you end up in um, Nanjing, I really you must you absolutely must go to the uh, Memorial Museum there. It's probably one of the most impressive museums you'll ever see. Um, so this, after we did the proof of concept with Pincus, this was sort of our our visual conception of where it would go when, when it was finished or what, we, what it would ultimately do. Um, I'll play this for you. Oh, no, I won't. Um, Okay, never mind. So um, ultimately, what we wanted to do is build a little setup like this. This is actually um, what we call the Pico Array projector. Um, it's 220 projectors, um, and it projects him onto a screen. It looks sim. Looks. Uh, it's a one. He was only filmed in 180, not 360. So. Um, oh. So we did it to be uh, platform agnostic or visually agnostic. You can do it in holographically. You should be able to do it in classrooms that other way. This is just on a 4K LED screen, life size. You could project it on a monitor like this. So you could do it on your computer and you can even talk to him on your phone. So we did it to be completely platform agnostic and open to everyone. Um, this was a theater, a holographic theater that was built in Chicago, the Illinois Holocaust Museum there. Um, this is about a 75-seat theater, and they did do a holographic Pepper's Ghost effect. It's not exactly what our vision was, but it works for them, so they're happy. This is the multiscopic array of Pincus. So it's the, probably the closest that you can get to a full body, true hologram. It was only done in 180 though, not in 360 yet. But I could literally walk around, like I could walk around Dan, I could see this side of him, and then I could walk around you and see this side of you. Which all added to the illusion of creating an environment where I would feel as if the person was there. Um, all of this, <laughs> I should say, um, had nothing at all to do with the real purpose. The tech had nothing to do with the real purpose. The real purpose was to enable you all to have conversations and to really ask the questions that were on your mind. So it was always content. We used technology in order to share the content the best way that we could possibly think of to do. Um, ultimately, what we would like is you to walk into a room, be able to have a conversation with somebody, anybody, and not even notice that there's any tech behind it. Um, that it's, it's, 
truly always been content first, which I think sometimes we miss, especially right now with um, VR and AR and um, all of this content that we've that we've taken can be put in those in those um, um, can be visualized with that um, and can be played with, but it's not about that. It's it's about enabling the conversation, the, the whatever way that generation is viewing it, is is encountering it and, and engaging with it. Um, this. So I wanted to show you. What's your name? My name is Charles Harris Melcher. Hmm. What should I ask him? Um, what do you do for a living? So I have two jobs. I run two companies. One's called Melcher Media, which is a book packaging company that has morphed into a creative services company. So we help people tell their stories in different media. And the other is the future of storytelling, which is an organization that I started seven years ago to explore how storytelling is evolving in the digital age. Okay. So what is this? This? is where we're going next with it, with the conversation. Um, what we wanted to do was, the one thing that we'll, while we were testing Pincus and the other 18 survivors in the public over the past uh, four years, the one thing that we got from everybody was, can I do this with my grandparents? Can I do this with my parents? My father was just diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Can I, can I use this and film him? Um, can I do this with the founder of my company? So he, can, he or she can talk to our 25,000 employees and they can feel like they've gotten to know that individual and the, about the company. Um, so we said, all right, what does it mean to make that technology ubiquitous for everyone? So what we've been working on recently for the last two years is making the technology ubiquitous so that all of you can record your loved one's family history, your loved one's stories, your loved one's experiences, and that your grandchildren will then be able to get to know that person in a way that they've never been able to do before. It could stay private or it could be on our uh, platform. So I don't know if any of you, do you, any of you recognize Mr. Wright, Jim? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah? Hello. Oh. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Oop. Okay, I'm still working on this. You guys are getting a sneak peek. Uh, not working. Let's ask Bromner. Oh, okay. What do you do for a living? Well, after graduating from uh, law school, I went into the publication of travel guides, and that has been the source of my income ever since. Um, that's what I do for a living, and now I'm retired, and although I'm still working on the travel guides and still earning an income from them, I never 
thought in a million years that at my age I would get, be still working as hard as I do, but for some reason I can't sim seem to rid myself of an obligation to the Frommer Travel Guides. We are now publishing over 110 guides, many of them in revised editions each and every year. And every morning when I get up, there are dozens of emails to me from authors uh, who are located all over the world all, who have various problems, various questions to ask. So strangely enough, at my age, I'm working harder than I ever did before, but that's what I do for a living. Does anyone know who he is? No? What's your name? My name is Arthur Frommer. <laughs> so you're the so so what about my grandparents? Right? So this is uh, Mr. Frommer and this is his granddaughters here. And his wife there. And they were interviewing him um, via the story file. It, what was really, really fascinating to us is um, he happened to be there during the interview. Now, so normally we're envisioning this as, as if they're not there and their grandkids or your great grandkids are getting to know you um, and, it, and you're not around anymore, but he happened to be there for the interview. And what happened was the girls would ask questions he would answer it via the app, via the application, and they learned a lot that they didn't know about him through their questions, and they would then turn to him and ask for more information or clarification, or they had follow-up questions. And it began this dialogue that they had never had before in their family. And the, the older granddaughter said, thank you so much, because I've never actually, not only did I learn a lot about my grandfather, but I've never had these conversations with them. Uh, so that was, it was truly, truly, uh, I mean, the mother of the two girls um, emailed us later saying, thank you. It was such a gift to the family because the girls felt like they had really gotten to know something about him that they never really realized enough to even probably ask or even to have that conversation. So it kind of forced something that was really beautiful for them. I think a lot of times you probably don't realize that, that you have a lot of conversation, you have a lot of questions for your relatives that you don't realize until it's too late to ask. Um, like you, we were talking about it earlier that, um, you know, you have grandparents and they pass away and then 20 years goes by and you have so many questions for them that you would never be able to ask. This would give you a way to do that. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of other applications, education. Um, think what it would be like to, to have a world famous physicist come into your classroom and the kids in your classroom be able to ask that person any question that they wanted. Um, about their life, why they got into physics, you know, what actually, why don't you describe to me what you did instead of the teacher describing to us what your theory is? Um, a lot, a lot of applications. So this is his wife and their conversation that they were having after and during. Um, he's adorable. So cute. Um, so what about me? So um, what if I wanted to leave? What if I wanted to leave my own legacy for my kids and my grandkids in my own words? What if I wanted to interview myself and do the same interview every 10 years and see how it's changed? Um, what if I have pictures? What if I want to film my grandmother or, or my mother even and have her explain I filmed the, filmed the actual picture and have her explain what we were doing, what was going on in that picture, who's in the picture. You know, how many of you have gone out and gone over to, have been dating somebody and their parents have gotten out a photo album at some point during the dating process? None of you? Really? Okay. So, 
at how many times have you looked at a photo and go, oh my God, that's so cute. What was happening in that? You know, and then the, then the parents get all excited and they explain the whole, to much of the other person's demise. <laughs> they explain everything. <laughs> so what happens to all that information though? Because you're not gonna really know the story. You're not, you might not remember it. What happens to it when you're gone? You know, who are these people? What do they, what, what does anybody care about having the, the picture in the first place? If you don't know who was in it or what was happening. Um, we wanted to give people a place to put all of that. Uh, family vacations. What was your favorite family vacation? And you can put your video that you guys made or your kids made of it and um, put that in and, and describe what was happening. This was our favorite vacation from da 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 and you can tell them all about it and then watch the video. Um, what if you have kids, you have a nine month old, right? What if every year when she starts talking, what if every year you asked her the same questions in almost the same place? What if you did it every five years even? How much would you like to go back and talk to yourself at five years old and see what you were thinking? How cute would that be? Um, so this is the way it's gonna work now. Um, we've made it somewhat ubiquitous for everybody. It's also platform agnostic. It can be done on a on a phone. It can be you can be filmed professionally. Um, your script can be bespoke. Eventually, you will be able to add questions into the script of your own because everybody will have your own questions. You'll have follow up questions. Someone will answer a, a ubiquitous question like describe who you are, and you'll have a you know you could have five follow up questions for that person. So you'll be able to add your own. Um, that you could do it on the computer, you could be filmed in 4K, we can film you volumetric in 360 and put you in, you know, in AR glasses, you know, in 10 years, probably five years. Uh, there are people, Andrew is one of them, who is working with a company right now that is going to eventually crack a 360 display that's practical and consumer, somewhat consumer ready. So a real hologram will eventually be ha at hand. Um, or you can just do it on your computer with you, using your computer's camera. You could, you, it would be a little bit more difficult if you did it on your own computer and you filmed yourself I mean, in your own camera um, because you'd also have to know how to edit it. Uh, but we're working on on tools to help you do that as well. So that's probably that would be what would be next coming up from us. Um, I think this is the Q and A part. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> <laughs> I think I skipped forty five yeah. minutes. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Seems to me one of the harder parts of this is figuring out what questions to ask. That's you have to very anticipate difficult. what the question is. So, yeah. I mean, the Holocaust is fairly constrained. Well, for the for with regard to the Holocaust survivors, um, both Stephen and I have have seen and actually been involved in hundreds and hundreds of Holocaust survivors giving speeches and Q and A's with the public, um, and through the the UK Museum. Um, we know pretty much what the public asks. There's about a top 100 questions. We asked each of the eight, those 18 Holocaust survivors anywhere between 750, and Pincus has the most at 1,935, um, But yeah, we wanted to stick to, you're right, it's a finite amount of data, right? I can't possibly ask you every question that the public would ask. So what happens then? If you don't have an answer for it, we did default answers for you to keep the conversation going. Um, there's that, that one. B, um, the, the natural language and deep learning and the, the whole machine learning and AI is getting a, a ton better. Uh, everything that we've done up until now has been manually or personally trained. So, um, even though it, it works off of a very large database and it's um, continually learning from itself and adjusting, 
it needed a tremendous amount of data and only people can do that right now. Um, second, the, the questions, we wanted to keep pretty universal. So there are always questions like ha the, how we did it for the app version is things that you would ask if you were getting to know someone. Where are you from? You know, just general questions. Um, do you have brothers and sisters? You know, things like that. We know that there are universal questions that people will always have, of, particularly of Holocaust survivors. There'll be universal questions that you could get pretty much from any um, sector, I guess, or, or experience. You probably have a list of universal questions that you could find and draw from. But it, that's, that's kind of the secret sauce. Definitely. <laughs> we have that patented, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I can hear him. But <laughs> Do you see a difference in the types of questions that people ask uh, a living person versus the representation of these people? And what can you learn from those differences in the types of questions? That, that was ask? really interesting. It was one of our questions is how would people react to the filmed version versus a real person? Um, no, they don't. There's absolutely no difference whatsoever. They, they go on. They ask complex uh, compound questions. They, um, they want to tell you your, their story first before they actually ask the question. <laughs> Um, they react entirely as if he's real, which is very interesting. We wonder, as this becomes more ubiquitous and in museums everywhere, we do wonder five years, ten years from now, will people react differently then? Because as you, right now they think he's real. They think, like I said, they think he's on Skype, even though we are not, we are not fooling anyone. We tell them up front, this is a filmed version of this individual. And that's another note. Um, Everything that those individuals say on any of these recordings on the video clips is what they've actually said. There's no editing, there's no manipulation, there's no characters, characterization of anything that they've said. So for instance, I can't stop someone. When they go on, like I tend to go off on bunny holes, right? You noticed during the speech? Yeah. Um, you can't stop me because you're, you know, that's not polite. <laughs> I can't stop them either. So whatever they say is what they've said. I can re-ask it and ask them to kind of shorten it, but both answers go in the database. So, and then there's another whole section to the natural language um, algorithms and, and myriad of data that has to be entered. To go with it. Yeah. So I'm trying to understand how many questions do you have to have in the database in order for it to have for you to have a conversation that is fluid, I guess. You said you had Yeah, obviously the times. more the more you've got, the better you the the more uh, natural your conversation is going to be and the more content that you have to get at. Um, without them going back continually saying, I don't have an answer for that, would you like to ask me something else? Um, yeah, or um, if it doesn't understand you, like let's say you do do a compound or a really complex question, um, they, the, the algorithm will say, could you repeat that? Um, if it still doesn't understand what you're saying, it'll say, um, maybe reword it, re-ask it a different way. Uh, if it really doesn't get it, it'll say, uh, I don't have an answer for your question. Would you like to ask me something else? Or we're here to talk about the Holocaust. Let's get back to that or my life or being a president. Or, you know, if, if the database is really small, they can get back to the conversation and, and redirect. We call it redirecting. So, so the conversation stays on task. You, you started at the beginning talking about how people or, or children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. feel that they have experienced it. And this oh, is yeah. called trans, transgenerational trauma. Right. And transgenerational haunting. And in some sense, you have given us the specters and the ghosts that will haunt us 
into the future, but then you move to mm -hmm. uh, programs that are not just simply about trauma, linked mm -hmm. to particular event and massacres and genocide, but really anyone can do it mm -hmm. to somehow immortalize themselves mm -hmm. uh, through these. So could you talk a little bit about whether doing it for the Holocaust is a way of also dealing with this trauma or, or trying to kind of bring it out and what would be uh, the benefit of actually just doing it as a form of virtual immortality? Um, I'm sure you have a really good story to tell about your life. Don't you? Do you think you do? I think everybody, every single person in this room has something to say about their life and how they've lived, choices they've made, things they've done, exciting things, sad moments, things that, the traumatic moments, happy moments, things they've lived through that they've learned from. So I don't, I don't think it's necessarily exclusive. Yes, Holocaust survivors have one particular story to tell and that's important, very, very important. Um, but I'm not going to say that everybody else's story is not important as well. You know, you have astronauts you can learn from, physicists you can learn from. You can, I'm sure I could learn something from this gentleman here. You know, it's not, I don't think there's anything <laughs> that's, that's truly, I, I, how many of you could say that I, that there's absolutely nothing I could learn from you? There's nobody in this room that would say that. So, um, yeah, it, this, the, it, is, it is mostly about keeping that alive and that story alive for your future generations as well. There's that element. So um, they obviously might care enough to get to know you <laughs> if you were their great-grandfather. <laughs> Uh, whereas this gentleman's child might not ever get to know. But the other element is there are people in this world that I would love to just get to know and, and know their story and know who they are and what they're going through. And I'll never get the chance to do that. I would never get the chance to ask a Yazidi person in a refugee camp a question, my own question, unless I go there physically ask them. So it's, it's just about what you want to learn. It's all about you. You can drive it. You could use it. You could not use it. I, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it's there. It's a tool for you to use any way you want to use it. Um, there was a question. Yeah, so I, I was, um, it's, it's really, you know, my mind's filled with all kinds of possibilities listening <laughs> to you. Um, I'm wondering whether, there's uh, either you're doing it now. There's a plan to uh, add other uh, types of media to the question and answering because I can imagine someone talking about something and then being able to uh, put in an image from their photo album or even from something that's connected with the period or the experience mm -hmm. that they're talking about. Or you know, yeah. I, I talk a lot about you know um, the material world being an archaeologist, say, and, I, and I'd like, you know, if I, I could see talking about something, but also having an image of that object um, that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just having, you know, watching the person speak, to me it seems that it might even be in terms of, um, might be, uh, in, in some cases, uh, allow more data, even um, require less of a person in a kind of studio presence to do that sort of thing, so that they're also talking about things that are important to them that are maybe more object-based instead of just... Yeah, that would just be audio-based, so it would all well, be, be like based a voice on... Almost it, like a voiceover, voiceover, or even having the right. person with you know, right. a, a window show up next to them or yeah. something that... You know, they can do it any way they want. They can focus the, the image, focus the camera on the image. Um, they can download the image and then do the voiceover through the speech recognition, but it would all be voice activated. So you could say anything about anything you want to. Is that it? Oh, one more. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, um, you know, uh, someone in a refugee camp and whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine tying this to a simultaneous kind of translator? 
where, where you know, the person is speaking in, in their native language, but then you have a translation program that's translating the questions sure. and the answers back. Yeah, sure. Uh, so our intent is to do it for every country and have it available in every language. We're going to do um, Mandarin, Spanish, I think we were uh, French, Russian, and we had a whole have a whole list. Um, and it's really it's only because technology's come so far in the last couple of years with regard to speech recognition. Google's got Google Translate works is working right now. Two years ago, it was working about seventy ish, seventy four. Now it's up to like ninety three, ninety six, like somewhere in there. So it's it's really working amazing. So yeah, you could ask a question in Mandarin of this system eventually when I get it programmed. Um, and the person right now will answer you in English. Uh, that could be simultaneously translated. This is all translated in real time, okay. completely real time. None of it, it, that was the big thing to make it ubiquitous, we knew that everything that we had done manually with the survivors had to be automated somehow. And technology had just kind of gotten there for us. We advanced it considerably over the past two years, but really it was just um, piecing together certain systems and then expanding on them and creating a, a, the ability for them to all talk to each other. So yeah, it could be in any language you want. Then. If Google Translate now does interpret the language and translates it as well as English, you can do your interview in Mandarin. You could, I could even ask you the question, or you could read the question in English, do it in French, and then I can ask you in English and it'll answer in French. I can ask you in French and it'll answer in French. It could, even, it could answer with subtitles as well, if you want to turn that on. Yeah, so hopefully, hopefully it works. That might not be available in June when it comes out, though. <laughs> not right away. <laughs> My future, future build, future build. Yeah. So when you mentioned uh, asking questions to relatives that have passed away, mm -hmm. that uh, kind of sparked something in my mind. I don't know if you've ever watched like Black Mirror, but mm -hmm. uh, it. How do you deal with? ethical problems, for example, uh, someone dwelling on someone that's passed away and just uh, using that to never get over. The grieving, yeah, the grieving process. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if that's for me to decide either. The One of the, for my 27-year-old, um, her first comment was, mom, I don't know if I want to talk to you when you're dead. And it's not necessarily, I don't envision it for that generation necessarily. I think it would be amazing, selfishly, for my five children to have gotten to know my grandparents, who I had a really deep connection with and I loved to death, that they never got to know. I would have at least loved to have been able to have them say hello to them. Or like, tell them how they met. You know, it would have really meant so much to me. Um, one of the first things that you forget about someone that's passed away is their voice. You can often see the see a image, but that's that has mostly to do with the fact that we have pictures. So occasionally, if you remind yourself what these individuals look like, it's imprinted in your memory. But the voice is the one thing that you, you lose. So just to be able to hear my grandmother say I love you would be amazing, because I can't remember her saying it. But yeah, I don't know. What will it do to, that's for, for other researchers to figure out. <laughs> I, I, I can't say, I, I'll put it out there in the world and if people do have a problem with it, then it won't work. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, anyway, I think that's a really good question to end on. I think there are all kinds of super interesting conversations yeah. to have around.
this kind of technology. So Heather. Also, who who uses it? Right. I mean, we we were going through that right now. Um, we had a company approach us to use the technology for something, and unfortunately, I mean, we we made the decision, the corporate decision, to not censor who uses it in a way. You know, if I can't, con I can control somewhat of what they say and what they've got on the platform, but if they're using it in their own private website and they're they're white labeling it. Um, I can't, I can't control necessarily. Everyone has to be able to use it in, in the way they want to use it. So as much as I'd like to say, you can use it, you can use it, and you can't use it, <laughs> that's, not, that's not fair either. So, but I have a workaround. I'm going to the opposite side. I'm going to tell them what they're doing and get them to do it. <laughs> so then everybody will be out balanced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.